and we got as far as compiling hello world in an ubuntu system and we confirmed that when we ran the executable we see hello world now this week we're going to build on that just a little bit hi eric hi hi how are you <laughs> sorry for being late not at all. Let me, I, I literally just started 10 seconds ago. So I'm going to start over. So last week, as I was saying, we went through the, the, the process of compiling C++ code in the Ubuntu environment in the Visual Studio code. And we did just some very um, bare bones procedures here of, of writing a hello world.cpp, um, which I've, I've re refactored a little bit for the uh, scope of the um, workshop today. I'm gonna see if I can move this little, yeah, there you go. Okay, I refactored it a little bit. Uh, so one of the things we didn't get to last week, we, we just got towards defining CMake list, but we didn't actually get to building the, the code using CMake and uh, talked about how, what we did do is we used G++ and then we defined the VS code uh, configurations so that you could, you could build code using this play button. And then the last step was to say, okay, if you are going to automate the process of building code and sharing it, you need some kind of configuration file that's more universal than the parameters in your environment. And that's where the CMake list comes in. It describes the C++ standards. It describes how to compile the code and how verbose you need warnings and errors to be, uh, what links into, what, what libraries link into executables, which executables you want. And that's as far as we got with CMake last time. And then I said, the next time we'll, we'll wrap this uh, up with some unit tests. So today I was thinking what we'll do is add some parameters. I'll describe some of the new parameters that I've added to CMake uh, and the refactoring of the code so that instead of putting everything in one file, we've, we're just describing as a small main function. And then we just define all the functionality of hello world in a class, which then gets compiled as a library. Uh, because typically what we'll have is different libraries getting linked together into an executable. And then uh, I'll describe the CMake list process and we'll, we'll also define some unit tests that test the executable and confirm if the unit test run. So this should round out part one. And then for part two, uh, we're gonna keep it a little bit short. And I, I don't know how far we'll get with, <laughs> with part one, if we'll even get to part two. But if, assuming we finish part one, we'll go to part two where really what we'll be doing this time is, is running some of the beginner exercises that Docker has defined to get up and running with Docker. So none of this is original work. It's just sort of go, stepping through the existing exercises that, that Docker has described and we can talk through them. How does that sound? Sounds great to me. Perfect. So Yurik, how did it go with, with your stuff last week? Did you, were you able to get your password reset? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was. I went to the uh, Ask Ubuntu and uh, sure enough, there was a, uh, a an instruction set there that uh, cleared the password and I was able to put it uh, back, back in and get Ubuntu up and running. But I did um, try and install WSL2. And so at the mm -hmm. moment, my uh, computer is honked up. Oh, OK. So is it running or it's? The computer is running, but um, uh, I wouldn't count on. Uh, I would think that uh, just following you on the screen would be best today. OK, that sounds fine. Uh, so just stop me if there are any questions. And I'm, I'm assuming that that uh, you're uh, going to 
essentially follow along with 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 reasoning instead of working on it uh, in tandem today exactly and your uh, git uh, hub file was great i was able to follow that and uh, follow the hyperlinks and instructions that was fantastic sounds good, sounds good. so i did update it uh, and so you might want to do a if you haven't installed git uh, definitely uh, do install it and then do a git pull so then you'll be able to get the updates as well. Um, all right, so moving along to the next step. So we where we left off last week, we had a hello world function. We didn't have this class, we just had a see out hello world. And what I've done is to demonstrate because C++ is an object oriented programming language and what we want in C++ is to develop classes uh, that, that gets compiled into objects and these objects do the, the work for us. They have a definition of what they are and what they do and so they have internal variables that reflect that. So this is a hello world class and I've put it in a header file. Uh, what it consists of is a a uh, constructor that, that builds the, the hello world object and a destructor that releases it once we're done using it. And two methods, one to say hello world in English and another to say hello world in Spanish. Now in C++, typically we'll have the class just defining the functions and uh, the headers just defining the functions and class, uh, class definitions. And then we'll separately have a C++ library where all the meat is, all the functionality is. And, and what this allows us to do is, is share just the headers with people or just the libraries. And, and for the, you know, if you recall the preprocessor step, this just looks at the headers and, and then it knows what the existing functionality is. So we'll typically separate the header from the implementation. And here you see the implementation. It's a, uh, it's all the implementations for the functions defined in the header. And I haven't put anything in the constructor because we're not allocating memory or anything. We're just printing stuff out to the terminal. And so the English prints hello world in English, in Spanish print, prints hola mundo in Spanish. And then here, the in order to compile this now, what we define here is in uh, some definitions in our CMake. So CMake will, will now include this hello world directory, right? So we'll add this directory because this didn't exist before. We'll add a library so that hello world gets compiled as a, a uh, object file that gets linked so we'll add it as a library called hello world live. And then for the executable of hello world, we'll say link the hello world library into this executable. So this is how the, the process now you see if you go back uh, where this linker links libraries here, what we've done is move our implementation that we had in, in the main function into a library, and then we're linking that library to generate the same executable. So far, so good. All right. So now what we'll do is in, in this. That, that was it. That was a yep. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> I, can't, I can't see if, huh? Same here, yes. I'm going to keep the chat open here too if you want to interact me th uh, with me through that. But if I don't hear back, I'll assume it's a yes. No, no, don't worry about it. We'll, uh, I'll go audio. Okay. Um, all right. So next, we'll, here are the instructions for, um, for the CMake list, getting the CMake list to, to you, compiling and building using CMake. And uh, my apologies, the last set were wrong, so I've corrected them. And so what we want to do, if you start here at 11 and we'll, we'll start building uh, using CMake, 
what we want to do is add a build folder so that so that all this binary stuff it just stays outside so it doesn't it doesn't mess up our um our repository because what we what we one of the things that um i'm just gonna call this back up one of the things that we what we don't want our uh, git repositories or any version control to have to deal with is gobbledygook files that don't actually are not human readable and and we typically want to keep those files separate so it's nice to have a, a separate folder for the build files. And so I'm going to create a build folder. And then that's where our, uh, that's where we'll build our code. So we'll CD into the build folder. And so the way CMake works is it will search your workspace to create the, the build executables in the folder that you call it. So if I say, if I go into this build folder and I say CMake build, oh, that's why build slash build does not exist. Oh, I, yeah, I misspoke. It should actually be just CMake. So now this, this creates the build files. And the build files are the recipe, if you will, for building the actual executable. So it's a bunch of CMake files. It's a bunch of binaries. It's, it's, it's the, the recipe. Uh, and the main ingredient is this make file, which will um, build the CMake code. All right. So I'm going to say no to this for now. but Typically, I do like installing installing the things that VS Code recommends. So, just I don't know what that's going to do at this moment. So I'm going to table that for later. But now we've built these build files, and the next instruction is to see make build into binary. So when we run this, it takes those build files and creates our executable. So it's linking everything. And here we get a warning. Um, I shouldn't ignore this warning, but you know, we're, we're, we've got arguments for passing into main that we're not using. So because we have a verbose CMake, it's telling us, hey, don't do that. Um, but now it's, it's essentially built all our files. And so here you see the hello world executable in the build. And so if I do that, slash hello world, you see this new code, hello world and hola mundo, uh, which is what runs in run hello world, right? And it's because CMake list now takes run hello world, compiles it into an executable, run hello world depends on the hello world library, which, is, which has this class definition. And then um, that's pretty much it for hello world. Uh, we'll leave Eigenad alone because uh, we didn't really do anything new with it this time. And the test, the, now the next good thing about CMake is it also lets you build the tests with the with the code. You uh, you know, this is optional. Um, it, it doesn't always make sense to have the tests running in the deployed code, but uh, sometimes if you're running like a developed folder, it's nice to have the tests running in the same environment. Um, so it's good to have these, these tests in the definitions in the CMake as well, or you could have a separate CMake for the tests. But for now, I've just added them, uh, them here. And what, what I do first is enable the testing. And then this part, uh, this takes the Google test repository. So Google has a framework that's very popular for testing, and I'll show you um, why in a second. But what this does is it pulls that repository off of GitHub and makes it available in the local build environment. 
And why we do that instead of just, you know, every single time, instead of having it um, just downloaded once and for all, is so that the tests are consistently the same versions across different builds. And, and we're, it's trivial enough to download them here. I'm sure there's probably a better way to do it, but I, I looked and it seems like this seems to be the recommended option is to simply download the repository for testing when you when you run the test. So this goes and um, creates a a Google test library for for our test function to use. Um, and I'll show you where this went. Let's see. I'm trying to look for it. Unique list dot test. Yeah, I'm not sure where it puts the test. Oh, there it is. It's in it's in the bin file, uh, in the build file. So it it essentially creates these uh, uh, tests and then in dependencies. If you look in the build dependencies, you see these Google test files also get downloaded. Uh, and it has its own CMake. So you see this structure of, of packaging and building code kind of play out in a lot of different places. And it's a good way to see how, how these are uh, deployed. So here then we, we've downloaded the tests. We add an execute, create an executable for the test. So first, but first we have to write them. And so this is the test file that, that I've written. And it calls the library that we're going to test because we have to create the hello world object in order to test it. It also calls gtest's header because gtest defines this uh, functional block for or a uh, test function for testing um, different functionalities of the code that you're testing. So you can what I do typically is I'll just ask, um, I usually will go to, to GitHub Copilot chat when I create a test and then I say populate or generate tests for this class and then modify those tests. So that is, it took a few seconds to, to write this file because it it's, writing unit tests is one of the things that AI does really well. <laughs> Uh, so what it's doing here is it's creating this object, hello world. It's capturing whatever it puts in, uh, it, it's creating a, um, a listener to capture whatever this hello world produces. So now hello, now we're running the, in English and then we're getting the captured, uh, string. And we're comparing the captured string to our expectation. So we expect the captured string to say hello world. If these two are equal, if the output is equal to hello world, this test will pass. Similarly for Spanish, if the output is equal to hola mundo, this test will pass. And then the main function, which is what runs when you do hello world test, It runs these tests and then it says, oh, this ran okay, two tests ran and both pass. So if the test pass, you're golden and this is how CMake defines the test. So again, you'll see you add an executable, you link the library. So in this case, it's using the hello, the test is using the hello world library and it's using the gtest libraries. So it's linking those two libraries and we also wanted to use the hello world header because we're calling the uh, the hello world um, object in and we're using the header here. So CMake list describes all the things that this text executable uses and then it builds the test and it adds the test to CMake's testing system. All right, um, any questions about that? So far, so good. All right. Well, so I guess with that, we can say that the testing um, 
Oh, let's see if I'm missing anything here. So yeah, we've we've built CMake, we've added unit tests, we uh, built, ran the unit tests and the test pass. So uh, another thing I guess to, to know about is when you're building these things, you might sometimes you know, have to rebuild them. So a good command to know about is make clean. So this kind of clears your build folder, uh, the cache in your uh, in your build folder, and then when you rebuild, you can uh, you don't have to deal with old binaries that are stale. All right. So we ready for containers then? Any questions so far? Not not just about the stuff today but in general about workspaces and any any other things that that are um that, that are on your mind i think we're good okay um Extensions was another thing I wanted to talk about real briefly before we move on. So let's see which ones I have. Um, I have the C++ extension pack. I have the CMake tools, Docker, GitHub Copilot, and then some extensions for Python. Uh, this is good. GitLens is great for seeing if your code is, is needs to be committed, it's nice when you are collaborating in a team and you want to see who wrote what code, it, it gives you that full line by line rundown of, of who wrote what. Uh, so these are some good extensions to have in, in Visual Studio Code. All right, so let's move on to Step two, which is containerization. Uh, so if if you haven't already, I recommend installing the, the VS Code Docker extension. Um, and then when you go to install it, it tells you everything that you need to know to, to get Docker set up. And so then when you run, let's say, um, let's see if we can install, let's see if we can go there. Docker. So I kind of wish at this point, I kind of wish that I had a clean slate environment that I could walk through line by line because I went ahead and installed everything on my end. Um, but I'll walk through the steps here. Let's see. Show me the. I want you to show up. Oh, there it is. Okay. So when you go to the Docker extension installation, it tells you how to install it. And then, yes, open it. Then when you go here, you get a Docker desktop for Linux, Docker desktop for Windows. I didn't opt for the desktop because I figured I'm going to be using it on the command prompt for the most part. So I went ahead with the Docker engine, which is your the Linux library for for Docker. And it let's see in Ubuntu how you can install that. So if you go to this. Um, and I think I've listed this in the README uh, to install. I'm going to close this one. So we're not dealing with that. All right. So yeah, if you if you go to this um, link, I'm gonna open it. Make sure. Yep. And this is how you install the Docker engine on Ubuntu. And so first you wanna uninstall any conflicting packages. 
So copy that and, and put that in your terminal. Close this guy. Right? And then, let's see. If, if app get says you don't have any of these installed, you're, you're good to go for the next step. And then this part, I just did line by line. I, I don't trust myself to copy the full block. So I did a, it doesn't hurt to do a, an app get update. So I'll just do that so you can see. It's good practice to do that on a regular basis. Then the next thing is to get the, the certificates. So the way Ubuntu does is it has your local certificates and then you can get rings, key rings for programs that you want to install. And then it secures a way for you to install that, that code. Well, you know, as long as you have the authentication, you have the key ring for the code that you want to install, then you can pull that repository. And, and then the next time you do an apt update, it installs it on your system. So let's just get that. Okay, it's telling me that I already have the latest version. Let me find those two lines together. So this, we're pulling the the uh, Docker um, keyrings from uh, from the Docker website and putting it into our local uh, Etsy folder, and then granting the the rights to read it um, and append to it in this folder. And then we're adding the repository to our apt sources so that the next time we say app get update, it pulls the repositories and updates it. So first we get the repository and then we do an app get update. downloading Docker, there we go. And then um, we install it. So first you download it and then you unpack and install the package. So this, you can just click that. All right, so I already have it installed, so it didn't do anything um, and then this is in, this step confirms whether you have it or not. So now if I say, what this does, when I say pseudo Docker run hello world, it's going into Docker's libraries, pulling an image that simply runs and says hello from Docker. And then it's pulling this, it's downloading the, the hello world latest and it's running it. And then I can see that it's saying hello world of hello from Docker. So this is a process of installing Docker, but I think I want to step back at this point now that we have it um, to talk about why, why do we want it? Why, why do we need Docker at all? And what are the advantages for, for using it? Uh, so what's your familiarity, Darren, uh, Yurik, about this, this uh, about Docker and this discussion? 
I can say I've heard of it. Uh, I know that it's used to um, containerize applications to get, you know, have isolation between applications. And that is about my limit. Yeah, I, I mean, I honestly, that itself is, that's kind of my limit too. But I think that more or less sums it up and it's powerful in that it really does sum it up because it creates a, a very um, uh, strong isolation between some system that you don't know a lot about and some system that you do know, which is the, the system in which you want your, your code to run. And it also gives you some isolation from different operating systems. You can make sure that your container has all the libraries that it needs uh, to run. And it, it isn't, uh, Docker is good about making, you know, you have to define um, the defaults make it so that it can't really just read and write two, two files on somebody else's system. You have to define the, the, the rights of the uh, software that's running an application inside of the container on that other operating system or that other computer. So it protects the other the system that runs your code and it gives you the, as the software um, application, it, you have all the, the application has all the libraries that it needs. And uh, within Docker, what you'll see a lot of the times is you'll have the um, CMake running, you'll have the Python uh, pip install of requirements running. So in the last um, workshop, we did CMake and we did C++, but Docker is great for running any kinds of code. And so in this particular example, um, Docker itself de describes the process of packaging a Python application and containerizing it. So that's what we'll do is, uh, is talk about, you know, how do you containerize an application? What's the process? And then there are a few things like terminology related with Docker that you might have heard of, you might have heard of um, images, you might have heard of containers. And, and so this is a good chart to see what's going on. And uh, you, have a, you have a Docker client that takes different commands that you give it and then sends it to a Docker daemon. And the Docker daemon pulls different images that are base images that, that Docker has in its own repository. And then you can build on top of those base images. You can modify them and create your own image. And then when you when you call Docker, uh, you, when you call Docker Compose up or you call Docker build, what happens is your image is the recipe and your container is the, the dish. So it takes that recipe and it brings up that dish and then um, you you know this container is then what gets deployed to different systems. Uh, you and one of the things that that we do to uh, when we create these images is we can to track the images. You can store them in registries, so you can push the, the images to a Docker registry. You, and this makes it also all of these scripts make it easy so that. If you have like a DevOps system or you have continuous integration and continuous deployment, the, the workflow is that you'll write some code, you or you make some changes to the Docker file, you check it into GitLab uh, or you check it into Git. And then when you do check it into Git, Git runs its own scripts that it says, oh, I got some changes to this image. Now I can upload this image into my registry. And then when you're deploying software, these images get pushed on to devices. And when the software update happens, it says, um, oh, I'm gonna pull a new image. And then it says, I have a new, when, I, when it gets a new image, it brings down the old, uh, old container and it, it builds a new container using the new image and brings up a new container. So that's what happens when a software update takes place that, and Docker is in the loop. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, 
So yeah, we can go down this whole rabbit hole of CICD at some point as well, um, because it's really cool how how Git uh, Git allows you to integrate. You know, when I say, oh, I made a change to the code, Git has hooks where it'll start building the image and sending it into a, a registry, and then you can you can deploy those images and bring them up on devices too. All right, so does that clear up kind of the distinction between images and containers and repositories? Works for me. Awesome. So we'll talk, we'll start with the Docker file. Now the Docker file describes the 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 structure of the uh, the image. You know what is it? Was it is it running here we, in the Docker file? We say it's running Python, and we're we almost always at the beginning of a Docker file. You'll see you'll see this from statement. So images aren't built from scratch. They usually use a base. So in this case, for the for the Python example, um, what the base we use is is Docker's Python version slim. So this is this is a string. So this would be this is the tag for Docker's tag for the image is three eleven four slim, and that's your base image. And then all the instructions that follow add on top of the, on on top of that base so if you want to follow along at home later um all of these things that i'm talking about are described here in this um containerize a python application so when you go here what you'll do is you you'll take this uh this um set of examples already des described by docker and then you'll define the Docker files and it tells you, uh, you know, what the different Docker files are. Just word of warning, this Docker in it doesn't work unless you download the, um, the Docker uh, SDK that, that I didn't download earlier. Uh, so this, this needs, I'm, because I'm using Docker engine, um, I will, manually create each of these. And this is a good exercise because this shows you what the building blocks are and how to create it. If, if you have the um, uh, the Docker application on your, on your uh, system, on my Windows system, I actually do. So I'll show you what it looks like. I don't have it. Yeah, if you have Docker desktop, I don't have Docker desktop. Do we want to download the ARM version or is it just the Docker Windows? Uh, you can download the Docker desktop for Windows. So the way I have it set up on mine is I have Docker desktop on my Windows system, but I don't have it on my Ubuntu system. On my Ubuntu, I just have the, the Docker engine. Thank you. And, and the Docker, you're creating an image on your computer that you will eventually just deploy uh, on virtual machines, right? Correct, correct. But the Docker desktop is a application that helps you do a lot of these things through a UI. Because typically you won't be working with one image, you'll be working with a, a set of images. So it shows you which containers are running. So I don't have any containers running right now on my Windows system, at least. It shows you what, how much CPU they're using, what ports they're, they're on, and what their IP addresses are. Uh, it, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about volumes to when we go through the Docker file. Um, so the Docker desktop is useful to kind of get a, a user interface, a feel for all the options, right? But then when you're deploying something, you, you'll probably capture everything as code in a Docker file. And, and so what you need at a bare minimum is this Docker engine. That's that when you say sudo docker and some command, it, it does that in your WSL environment. Got it. Could you show me your apps that you have installed uh, again? For the, yeah. uh, the extensions. I want, make, I want to make sure that I got them all. Uh, do you mean the extensions? Yes. Yeah, right here. So 
So this is this is what's installed in. Oh, this is a good question too. Is the VS Code has a lot of different shells. It's like an onion. Uh, so this is you know you. What I like to do is I sync my extensions across different uh, instances of VS Code. So I have all of these extensions in locally. That's like on my Windows computer. And then I've synced some of them to the Ubuntu environment. So in, in WSL, these are the ones that are available to me. And then when you when you have an extension, you have the you have the ability to sort of sync it or um, here you can say install extensions in WSL Ubuntu. So depending on which environment you're in, and this this can be a little bit annoying if you're switching environments a lot, which, which when you start working with Docker and we'll see towards the end of the exercise. Right now, I'm in the WSL environment, but I could very easily be in a Docker environment. And then that Docker environment doesn't have my extensions, right? So it's, it's, it's nice to have a way to sync across these. And sometimes you just go to a new environment and then you install it all over again in that new environment. Right. Otherwise you've got to know what you are locally. Yeah. 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 So you can't count on all of your extensions being available in all of your environments, but at least you have them, them locally. And, and once you develop these persistent environments that you're working in, then you'll have the extensions installed there as well. Thank but you so much. It, yeah, for sure. This is, this is what, you know, with VS Code, it's very flexible. And sometimes that flexibility can, can create more options than you want, but that's what makes it very powerful too. Um, all right, so going back to the containerizing an application in Python, right? So Docker provides a very nice step-by-step -step, uh, way to do this. You, What you do is you download the Python Docker. So I'm just going to go there so you can see what's in there. Okay. So there's nothing Docker related in here because you're going to add all the Docker related stuff. All this does is it, it initializes a small hello, hello world uh, program in Python and it defines the requirements for it to run. And then for the exercise that, that Docker supplies, uh, you create all the other files. So uh, if I go back to, let's see. Go back to that. And if you go here, you can manually create the assets. So these are the different configurations that we'll be using. Chief configuration is this Docker file that I was talking about. Um, so this Docker file, it describes the base. It describes the some configurations which Docker tells you. This this configuration environment specification says don't write the, the uh, bytecode Python files um, and, or it says py prevents Python from writing PYC files. So it says, just write the Python uh, in bytecode. Uh, it says, keep Python from buffering stood out and stood -er. So um, it, it just, makes it so that all the, the errors and outputs are, are sent to the terminal right away. It defines the work directory as apps. So this, you know, when you, uh, this is the directory that when you bring up a container, you'll start at this app directory. And then it describes a user, uh, you know, it assigns a user that, that is active within this app environment. And then this, this last step is to download all the, the requirements for Python. So Python's using certain libraries, these libraries or packages as we call them in Python are described in requirements.txt. And, and so 
what it's doing when you bring up this doc, uh, Docker file, it it will it will start with this base. It'll describe certain characteristics. It'll identify a user, and then it will pull these um, libraries, install them using using pip uh, in that environment, and then you'll switch to the uh, this app user that we described, um, and then copy the source code into uh, into the container. So uh, whatever is in the in the folder that this Docker file lives in gets copied into the container. And then we we expose a port that that application listens to. Um, and then this command runs the application. So this app.py is run by Python 3 M flask run. That's the um, that's what this gets built into this flask executable and it runs it at a certain IP address and uh, a certain port. So that's where it sends its output. Um, so let that's what the Docker file looks like. Any questions about what the Docker file is and what it does? So this this describes the parameters of an image, and and now we move on to the compose file. So the Docker file describes one image, but in any typical application, you might have multiple images working together. So if you go to this compose.yaml, what compose.yaml does is, so Docker the file describes the image and compose describes the different services that are run and the different images that each of those services uses. So in this, it's just running whatever is um, in the current folder and listening, um, sending the, the output of that service to these ports. So all of the services that, that are running are, are listed with certain names in here. And, and they could be multiple services coming from the same, um, a container or or multiple containers, but the compose is what tells describes what's running and where it's sending its output to. And so this is used to orchestrate different Docker images and different processes. And also it defines uh, we'll come to in the next exercise volumes environment and things like that. Okay. Um, so going back to the, let's see. So the other file, this is not super important, but Docker ignore, it defines what else, like any of your, you know, your local VS code configurations, things like that. They don't have any business being in the, the container that gets deployed. So the Docker ignore file, tells uh, it puts a list of typical folders that are in a in developer's environment that don't go into the production container. Uh, so at the if you follow these steps, at the end you get to this folder structure, which I have over here, and and you have this app. Uh, it's using the Flask library and it's defining an application that returns hello docker and what what doc docker file does is it runs that application and it listens um for the response on uh at this ip address and and this port so let's see how that's working out so when we when we want to run this docker file right what uh, we want to build it um the way that that uh, Docker, it, it describes it here as Docker compose up build D. So it runs that application in the background. So I'm in the, actually need, in order to run this, I need to be in the folder where the Docker file is or the, where the Docker compose file is. So I can see that the compose.yaml is here. 
and I can say Docker Compose build. So now it's building the container based on this Docker file, which describes the image. And it's going, it takes a little while because it builds it in, in little pieces. And here it's, it's nice to see all the steps that it's carrying out. So literally it's taking that pip install. If you go back, it was installing all of those libraries in the container. And now it has, it says container started. And a useful command here is Docker PS. And that shows you which containers are running and where they're running. So now this container is running. It's running an application using Flask to send hello Docker to this IP address in this port. Um, and so I'm going to check if, if that actually is happening on this system uh, by going to the, the said point. And you can see that that we are getting hello Docker. And now if I do Docker compose down, this is a counterfactual here to make sure that I don't just have something else putting it over there. Now the now the container will stop. Say Docker PS, no container running, go back. Check again, fresh. Let's see. Yep, this doesn't exist anymore because there's no hello world going on there. Questions, comments? Yeah, that was very fast. That was uh, interesting that you described what it was going through and. Uh, that it actually it created it and then removed it and yeah. how we verified that it was working. Now the uh, actual uh, port that you were mm -hmm. looking at, it, it, yeah. you use that as local and then the port number? Yeah, so localhost, when, when I say localhost is just going to 0000, zero, zero, zero you can send it to another port, uh, another IP address if you want. Um, so that that's the the part where you know you'd have to know wh what else is running there and and then uh, that port and and those are things you can actually dis dis define in the Docker file. Um, actually, no, you'll define them in the compose. So this this describes. Uh, we'll we'll dig deeper into the compose, but compose tells you what the Port definitions are on the Docker side and on the host side. It defines the mapping. So it does this in a lot of ways, right? Like it'll say even uh, what you want to with Docker containers. Sometimes you want some persistent place where once the container is down, you don't want that data to go away. You want the container to actually have access to a persistent location on the computer in certain cases, say in this case, it's a database. So on the left-hand side, you'll have the, the Docker location. And on the right-hand side, you'll have the, the mapping on your computer. Um, so that's, what, that's how the ports are described, uh, defined here. Uh, and you can expose certain ports again in in uh, in the compose file, and uh, we'll get to that in the second exercise. Does that answer your question here? All right, so. There we go. Now my mic is unmuted as an alt okay. A on my keyboard. <laughs> I okay. was pressing uh, the space bar, which is usually what I unmute with, and that was only working temp very temporarily. <laughs> but yes, that, that answers my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so this next part of the exercise actually is not completely working on my end, I have to admit, but I, I, I do want to walk through it again and see if we can try and debug it together.
so uh, this is, was the first part. We just created a simple application, right? Uh, if you go back to the, the page that I was showing you earlier, where we had, uh, let's see, not this one, not that one, yeah. The next thing, you, next step is how do you develop your application using multiple containers? And so there's another, another repository that Docker has for called Python Docker Dev with a little bit more complex application. So let's take a look at that. Uh, we have this application that has more than one. It, it looks up something in a database and it fetches something from a data. Does the the thing that we were doing before it does this hello docker too but it also defines a postgres database and uh initial a function to initialize the database and then um pull some data from that database so what does the docker file look like for that um docker file still looks pretty similar um no change here i made uh, they the only thing that they did is instead of using port 8000 they they're using port 8001 don't ask me why needless um complication and then uh i added these two lines and i'll i'll tell you in a second why i did that uh but it, the docker file remains the same but now because your application is relying on this postgres database Compose.yaml describes what that is. And lucky for us, so I, I remember I said, Compose.yaml describes a set of services that run when this, when you say Docker Compose up. Come on. I don't know why it doesn't like my tab complete right now. When you say Docker Compose up, it goes to whichever compose file you have in the folder that you're running. So I'm going to CD out of this and CD into uh, the dev one. Um, and so it pulls when I say Docker Compose up. It starts uh, executing all the instructions in the compose file. And what it does is launches these services. The, so the server service builds the current Docker file, this Docker file. And, and then in the database service takes this Postgres image and defines a, some secret value to it. It just defines a volume for it, you know, persistent place for the data. It defines some environment variables. In this case, it's a Postgres DB is called example. Postgres password file is called run secrets DB. Uh, it exposes a port at which this database can be queried. And then it defines some health checks. And then for the, um, it, it that that's those are the um service definitions but then there are also some volume definitions so there's a db data and then the secrets that we use in uh in here are just did i defined further here which is this db folder with a password file in it which i have here so this is the password it's expecting, my secret password in the DB folder. And this is the error that I was seeing is that it doesn't like the, the Postgres password for some reason. Um, so I must not have followed the instructions perfectly well. Uh, so we can go through them, um, but I wanna pause for questions about the extra definitions in, in Docker Compose. I'm following so far. Okay, good. So uh, let's see. You go here. We uncommented these extra fields in um, in Doc Compose. We created the before you run the application using Compose specify password dot dot text file, and it says create a new directory named DB, and inside that 
in the clodent repositories directory, right? So which is this Python Docker div, create DB and password.txt with this password in it, save and close. This is the folder structure that I'm expecting. And this is the folder structure that I have. And now what I'm gonna do is Docker compose. So say Docker compose up build. Let me try that again. I like to see Docker PS and another thing that is useful is Docker PSA because it shows you some of the cache folders too. So it looks like I have a lot of junk in here from other things I was doing. Uh, so I'm just going to say Docker system prune and it, it should delete everything. Now, Okay. Now I don't have any of that stuff and I got three MB back. Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's modest compared to some of the images I've used in the past. Uh, not encouraging building giant Docker images by any means. Um, all right. So let's try this again. Docker compose build. So it's going to build that Docker file. Now it's saying um, Postgres database directory appears to contain a database. Okay, so it's initializing, it initialized the database. So far it seems to be happy, but then it suddenly crashes. Uh, and the reason it crashes is because it can't seem to, let's go back to this app.py. Um, in app.py, it looks like it, it's it's when it runs app.py, it's looking for this Postgres password file, right? But it's not finding the Postgres password file in environment and is going straight to Postgres password, which also doesn't exist because we never defined it, right? Post, Postgres password isn't something we defined. We just defined the Postgres password file and we said, to look for it in run secrets db password. Now, where is run secrets db password? It should, it's got something to do with secrets and, and the db password is db password.txt. So this is the, kind of the missing link that I'm trying to figure out what's going on here because I'm not seeing the, uh, the link to that here. Let's see. Password.txt. Um, all right. One more second here to see if I can identify what's going on. We have Postgres password file. I'm just going to say this is a no-no, but we're going to do it just for debug purposes because you don't want to put passwords in a compose file that gets shared all over the place. Uh, but I'm going to say Postgres password equals my secret password as an environment variable. And then let's see what happens. Start building again. Okay, it seems to like it so far. Uh, let's see if we can, so, nope, it didn't like it. So I guess maybe I wonder if it's, it just didn't find that environment variable at all. So something about these environment variables, it's not getting defined. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can figure that out offline um, and update the, uh, you know, either either send it out uh, to the Docker com community and ask about it or figure out what's going on there. Um, but essentially that 
that describes the process of this is a good exercise to go through if you want to figure out how docker really works that that helps a lot um, but i'm going to go back to the basic exercise i can show you one more thing so i'm going to stop the database container and i'm going to stop the uh, go back to this initial simple exercise that we did, the Hello World one. And then say Docker Compose up. All right. And now we have something up and running and and let's see, Docker PS. All right. So what, what one of the things we'll do in the next workshop is, is run ROS and, and run applications in ROS. And when we do that, we're going to be creating, a, so in this case, our image is a image that's got a Python um, com interpreter and it's got some application Python application running. But when we build a ROS container, we'll, we'll start with the ROS image. Uh, so it's a, it's essentially an Ubuntu image with ROS already installed on it. So that's our base. And then we'll add some applications to that image. And typically when you're working on a robotic operating system uh, and you're working on robotics applications, you a lot of the times you want to debug things in that environment. You want to see what's going on. You want to see which applications are running um, and you want to do it seamlessly. But, you know, it, being able to see it as a Docker image alone isn't helpful. So one of the things that, that you can do is you can attach the VS code to a running container. Uh, and so in this case here, I, it gives me the, uh, this is the container that's running and I can attach to it and it creates another VS code environment. Um, and now it's saying error in attaching to the running container will de debug it in a second. Why? Because if you look at the, the errors, it says it couldn't write to this this folder, right? It couldn't write the image to this folder and that's why VS Code had op er issues opening it. So I'm gonna say close, close this window, go back and modify my Docker file. Uh, so in order to give it, uh, you know, in order to be able to, to tunnel in with VS Code, we need to allow the user to write to that application uh, user to write to that environment. And this is probably not something you want to do in production, but if you're, you're working on something locally, um, you can you can give this um, this user some more uh, some more rights. So I'm going to go back and change my docker file here. So yeah, just adding this line where we're giving this, this user ownership on, on that app folder. And then I can try and build it up again. creating the Docker container, attaching it. Okay, now it's it's running that and I'm gonna create a new instance uh, by saying attach to running container. Select that, creates a new instance of the VS code window. Oh, didn't like that, okay. Well, I stand corrected. <laughs> see close remote not sure why i didn't like it that time 
Did I use the right file? That's sometimes I just like to prune all the containers and see if uh, if they get built correctly. So uh, Okay, let's try this once again. And if it doesn't work, then I'll take it on as homework to fix it. Um, so Docker Compose up. So that's running. Now let's try and attach to it. Open Docker. No, I guess it did not like that. Ah, I know what I'm missing. I know what I'm missing. Okay, so I added this here. I'm going to compare these two files. This is probably why. Hmm. I guess that's not it. I, I thought I knew what I was missing, but that might not be it. In any case, I think what, what I um, will conclude with saying is that if, if you have your Docker file permissions uh, defined correctly, then, then you should be able to attach to a running container and then, and then um, you know, you would be able to interrogate that container. Let's see, try it once again. So when you are attached to it, you're adding code to it? Uh, no, you're not adding code to it, but what you would be able to do is uh the in the you know how when i bring up um let's say so when i bring up a new window in in vs code right and i let's say i uh, close remote connection so if i close the connection now this is just running in my windows environment and it's running on my operating system um and and this allows me to run on a different uh, if i say connect to wsl it'll run on the wsl environment if i say run on the uh running container it'll run on this uh, docker container that we just created and then when you go into if this does come up successfully when you go into terminal it brings up that app work directory that that we created in that container. So when it brings up that work directory, you know you're inside the Docker container. Uh, you have the applications running in that container that the, the Docker container uh, launched. And then you can sort of use the terminal environment there to interrogate and, and interact with those applications. Thank you. For sure. Sorry that that didn't work out. Uh, we'll try and figure out what's going on there. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing here and just going to open up the floor to any um, people. Uh, is in terms of like what we've done so far in the last two workshops, any questions, any sort of uh, what are we looking for in the next one? Do you feel like we want to go into, into ROS and, and building like a ROS environment out or would it help to, 
to zoom back and, and work through some of these existing things again. I see for John, I think that uh, I was able to um, duplicate your GitHub uh, repository. So I'll be able to work locally on that. Okay. Um, uh, there's a bunch of installations that I still have to do, but it looks okay. like uh, I've got uh, an, an up and running system and uh, getting a, a pretty good handle on things. So thank you very much. For sure. Uh, I'll go ahead and um, fix some of these issues with Docker that I'm having in, uh, and, and, you know, if I'm having them, I'm, I'm sure people might be having some flavor of those as well. <laughs> so I'll try something and, to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, I'll try and clarify, and then will that should have us set up to because we we what we've done so far is we've defined a C plus plus application, we've defined a Python application running in a Docker environment, and what what we want to do in the third uh, workshop is create a ROS Docker container that runs both a, a C++ and a Python application and, and then does some kind of message passing across the application so we can see how in a uh, robotic system, different applications come together. Uh, and then I guess the stretch goal might be to have multiple Docker containers running that do different things and, and see how, how that orchestration works. Excellent. All right. Uh, there was something else that I was thinking about, but I can't remember right this minute. Um, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can just reach me on that GitHub directory, uh, GitHub page, and you know, hopefully uh, you have some food for thought, even though we're, we're ending early today. Definitely. Thank you.